your mouth podcast a podcast all about phrase etymology and why we say the things that we say i am milo and i'm dave he's my dad and she is my daughter that is how that works yes and we are going to say this at the beginning of every i think you say that a lot but i think it's important for establishing like you know they say that every episode is someone's first episode it's true so people might not know that you're my dad and i'm your daughter well, I'm so not it's complaining. good to establish it is good to establish <laughs> i just need to make clear to people who listen uh-huh. all the time and i wonder as people are listening are they like are they going to say that every time and i'm answering that oh, I see. as they're asking it delightful some of them not all of them but if it's your first <laughs> some episode some of them actually trust us <laughs> it's so if this is your first episode welcome Welcome. We're glad you're here. We are. We've been doing this podcast for a few months now. Uh Uh-huh. And this is probably around episode... I think 12 or 13. 12 or 13. And I was thinking about this as I was putting my episode together uh, for today, that when I started this, when I got this idea, Mm -hmm. you know, researching these idioms and phrases and eventually in every once in a while songs and even people will bump into before too long, I'm like, well, how long can this last? Like, how many episodes can we really do? Already we're considering our mortality at the young age (laughs) of 13 episodes. What's our exit right here? (laughs) No, but I wanted, and I do want this to go on for a long time, but I just didn't, like, how many different phrases can you really come up with? But as you research and you start to listen for it, Mm -hmm. there are all kinds of different phrases and things we say. Yeah. Uh, It actually... This is kind of a freebie. This doesn't have a ton to do with the actual episode. Once I was aware of the idea, like, okay, we're going to start really doing this podcast and we're going to start researching these different idioms. All of a sudden, they started popping out of all over the place. I started seeing them. And there's actually a, a, a term for this. You may have heard of it. It's called the Bader-Meinhof phenomenon. I have heard of that. Yeah. It's the weirdest thing. It really is. And I did a little research on Bader-Meinhof, and that's not what this episode is about, but I wanted <laughs> to throw it in there. Um, Bader-Meinhof phenomenon is actually a term for frequency illusion, mm-hmm. which I got this information from a, a site called Science Alert. Um, so Bader-Meinhof is term for frequency illusion, which is a type of cognitive bias your mind creates. Mm -hmm. In short, it's when your mind deviates from normal, rational thought and starts to make up patterns based off of nonsense or nothing. Right. Because our brains are very good at pattern recognition. And it really gets excited when it finds a new thing and it's like, ooh, new thing. And then you see new thing (laughs) everywhere. So if you were, if you just bought a new car, um, like Milo, you just bought a newer car. Ford Fiesta. Have you noticed you're seeing I have. You're like, everyone's driving. These. And it was definitely a thing of when I first like came across it on the site I was car shopping on. I was like, oh, I don't know if I've ever seen this before. <laughs> and then as soon as I like got behind the wheel of it, they were everywhere. They're like, everyone has one. You know, I am a trendsetter, but I don't think that's to you blame are, in this situation. For sure. No, it's just, it's our friend uh, Bader and Meinhof who mm-hmm. came up with this together. So that's that's just a freebie. Um, and as I was looking at this this term that we're using today... Uh, some of the terms that we look up are fairly recent. Some of them are quite old. Mm-hmm. Um, the oldest one so far is probably Abracadabra. Yes, or the story of Sappho. Yes. That. Very ancient terms. We're going to go real old for this one today as well. Cool. So Buckle up your time machine hats, folks. That's right. Is that Do they have buckles on the time machine hats? Mine do. I don't know. That okay. seems to be the fashion of the day okay. or the yesterday. Oh, or the future. Exactly. Because it would have started in the future, maybe. Not necessarily. You don't know when the time machine mm-hmm. was invented. That's true. You're right. You're right about that. So this, this phrase, this term that I came up with today um, that I wanted to research is one we use all the time. And it, yeah, a little (laughs) bit of a pun there, because today the episode is about why we say o'clock. Interesting. Yeah, and it was one of those things, as I had got into this podcast and Paint the Town Red and Hunky Dory and some of the ones we've already done, 
those just kind of stand out and we're like, oh, that's kind of weird. Let's take a look at that. And then as I become more aware of this, you hear certain things and you go, why do we say o'clock? I mean, that doesn't like where is what's that about? But we say it all the time. Is it because we're all secretly Irish? It is. Do you have an Irish accent there, Milo? I really don't. Don't you? Not really. And then people, they're, they're turning off their, their podcast because they sure they're like, are. this is horrible. Why would they do it? <laughs> so the rest of the podcast, I'm going to do this Irish accent. I think it's part of expected in this podcast now for new folks, by the way. There's yeah. a weird accent somewhere every time. Weird accents and cool names. Yep. And this, this episode will not disappoint, by the way. I have a name for you. Oh, boy. I'm yeah. so excited. Yeah. She honestly doesn't know what it is. So this <laughs> no, is it'll be new for her. Okay. So one of the first things I found as I'm doing a little bit of research on this is I found that o'clock is pretty much something only English-speaking people do. That makes sense. Yeah. Other, other, you know, other uh, languages, they do not. The French don't say o'clock. The Spanish don't say o'clock. O'clock in French is horloge. Oh, very it's fun nice. to say. And so we it's pretty much an American thing. I, obviously, we know this. We say it here in America. They say it in the United Kingdom. And I checked with, again, a shout out to my friend Jane in another, Australia. Another uh, through line <laughs> of most episodes is Jane from Australia. Yeah, it is. She's amazing. Um, She's like the cryptid of the podcast. She really is. Yeah. And so, and she does exist, by the way. Um, it's she, presumed. Well, I, well, true. I, I guess that's. That's Flat Earthers believe that Australia doesn't exist. So. Oh, and wait, what? <laughs> Are you serious? We're bunny trailing already, but yes, there is a certain subsection of the Flat Earth movement who believe that Australia is a myth. Oh. The whole continent. Sure. Why and not? country. Okay. And states of Australia. Did they have states? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so anyway, she confirmed with me this morning that yes, indeed, they do say o'clock in uh, Australia as well. Thanks, Jane. But the, yes, thanks, Jane. Another interesting thing I thought is, I found or thought of, is we only say o'clock at the top of the hour. Uh huh. And of course, we say top of the hour because that's when the second hand and the, you know, the minute hand and the hour hand are pointing up. Mm-hmm. So that's why you say the top of the hour. And we don't say 4.30 yeah, because o'clock. because it's time is a constant downhill. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's, a, it's a cheery podcast today, boys <laughs> and girls. Hope you enjoy it. Um, I've got a lot here, so we're going to kind of move a little bit quickly because oh, no. I, I want to cover a lot of things. Okay. Uh, because as I thought about time and some of the, and which is pretty deep right there, but there's a, there was a few different things that I just, I didn't want to devote entire episodes to some of these tangents, but they are related to time. Okay. So obviously time is very, very important for humans. Mm-hmm. And the whole idea of time. We're going to talk about more of the measurement of time and some of the ways people have kept time. So obviously this has been going on for thousands of years, if not longer, since there have been humans. Yeah. People have been paying attention to time. And it is still important to us today, of course. Yeah. Right? But back many, many years ago, you needed to be able to dictate and understand different types of time because that was a matter of life and death. Okay. Right? Explain. Seasons. Oh, for sure. So yes. the seasons, okay. um, you know, when is it going to get dark? How far away can we be from home before the darkness comes? Mm-hmm. Because that's going to be more dangerous. So it was a much, I would think, probably a little bit of a broader concept as we've got it so dialed in now, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, about how in more and more precise we keep trying to become with advancements of technology and some of it's a bit wild. So... Years and years ago, they weren't as worried about some of the smaller aspects of time, like seconds and minutes. Right. They were more concerned about days and daylight and seasons, things like that. Because for them, time was things like, hey, when do we plant? Mm-hmm. You know, how long until we harvest? Yeah. You know, when when will the food be ready? Yes. Which is kind of an important thing. Yes. And gets very wrapped up in religion, too. And we'll touch on that a little oh bit, too. Oh, boy. Good. Yeah, we, we're going to cover a lot. So, and I did a little bit of research, because this whole idea... I would hope so. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I'm just making this stuff up like I do every episode. <laughs> but I, speaking of the food aspect of yeah. it, and, you know, I did a little research on this specific point, and I found out that they did not have McDonald's thousands of years ago. What? I know. How but did they survive? I know. So they had to worry about things like crops and things like that. But conversely, 
I did find out that chicken nuggets will not decay for thousands of years, just like the honey in the Egyptian tombs. Is that true? No. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> it was troubling. Um, McDonald's fries are completely inedible after about two minutes and 45 seconds. Unless you have an air fryer. Secret hack. What? Air fryers. You can redo McDonald's fries mm-hmm. and they'll be crisp and yeah. wonderful again? Yeah, air fryers are kind of magic. Oh, uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they're great. But you know, if you're eating McDonald's fries and they start to get cold, they're they're worthless. Oh, I know. They're you're just driving around little lymph noodles, and you don't have that air fryer, the portable air fryer, with you in your car. <laughs> Goes into the cigarette vent thing. <laughs> sure, why not? Get back on track here. Um, so again, we're going to talk about time, not in a Stephen Hawking, Albert Einstein sort of way, but again, more of the practical pieces of it. Um, so. Was it, we call this a podcast for the curious. Mm-hmm. Some of the things as I was going into and diving into why we say o'clock brings up a lot of other questions for me in regards to time. Yeah. So I started thinking like, well, time is so much based on the number 60 mm-hmm. um, and the and number 24. And so my brain goes, well, what's that about? Yeah. Like, why is this happening? Why is that a thing? And we have been using, we as humans, not Milo and I. Um, although us too, because we are humans. We are humans. We are, yes, we just, don't I, fear. Established that in previous episodes. So these two numbers, um, sixty and twenty-four, have been part of timekeeping for a very, very long time. Pardon the pun again. The ancient Egyptians actually separated daylight into twelve segments of time and the night into twelve segments of time. Wow. And, and from what I could tell, the number sixty was used because it has so many factors or numbers that it's divisible by. Okay. I'm not exactly sure, and I I could have went off on that tangent for a while, but I needed to kind of rein it in a little bit. But if you, again, if you want to research that, there's a ton of information in history as to why the number 60 was used um, by the Egyptians and then the Babylonian and Greek and all that, that stayed. It's very That old. might be a little time or like math heavy for, for us as we are yeah. not entirely math people. I was thinking of that too of like, oh, maybe we should talk about time zones at some point. But then I was oh. like, oh, I don't think I can understand time zones. Well, a lot of this does get very mathematical uh-huh. and I, I would not say you're a slouch with math and nor am I, but I have no, not I had find. any sort of higher education in math other than uh, trigonometry in high school, which isn't obviously not very advanced at all. But I did well. So uh, from what I could tell, um, again, the number 60, is it's called, you know, like this, the current sexagesimal system of time. Ooh. S- that, that's your, uh, your $100 word for the day, sexagesimal. Sexagesimal. Yeah, you'll know, see it right there. That, the, being based on 60... Uh, is about 2000, it's from 2000 BC, probably from the Sumerians. But I really just threw that in there because I wanted to say sexagesimal because it makes me sound like I'm smart. So without going into a lot of back information, we, our current way we use time, measure time, um, has been influenced by the ancient Babylonians, the Greeks, the Egyptians. They all had a big impact on how we tell time now. Mm-hmm. Uh, a little bit of detail. Uh, we like to give credit where we find some of this information. Uh, there's a website out there called Seeker, and I wanted to read this because I thought this was interesting. The ancient Babylonians take credit for the hour being made up of 60 minutes, specifically. For reasons that remain unclear, they used a base 60 system of counting. They also divided the circle into 360 parts, which the ancient mm-hmm. Greeks then built upon when they tried to divide the earth into 360 lines of land, longitude and latitude. Uh, Ptolemy divided these into smaller parts, which he called the first minute, and those got split into 60 parts, which he called the second minute, which is why those are called seconds. Interesting. Yeah, kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't until the 18th century, or sorry, the 16th century that minutes and seconds were even widely used when telling time. And that's when more accurate mechanical clocks were able to keep up. Um, the first ever clock with a second hand dates back to Germany around 1560. Okay. Kind of cool. Mm-hmm. So then as we technology increases and we become more civilized and humanity evolves, the so that by the time of the atomic age, this is... This is crazy, and I don't understand the science behind this, but I just Uh want to throw it out there. Um, So the most accurate clock ever so far, um, the atomic clock, it measures one second by counting off 
nine billion one hundred ninety two million six hundred thirty one thousand seven hundred seventy energy transitions from the cesium atom. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but even though that sounds insanely accurate, uh huh, or at least insanely exact, insanely exact, which, yeah, which is going to tie into exactness, tying into the accuracy, right? Um, they still have to uh, they have to add a few seconds every few decades. Uh, every decade, they need to add a few seconds, which this is called the coordinated universal time. And they need to add a few seconds because the Earth's rotation around the sun slows a little bit every, right. every 10 years. It's a little slower, affecting the length of the days. Right. And that's where I run into issue with like words like accuracy when describing time. <laughs> because it's so goddamn made up. Oh, it <laughs> like, is. It's made up. So how can we say that it's accurate? I think about that mm. with, like, because my, my new car's clock is, like, very slightly slow. Mm. So, like, once a week, I'll need to change it by a minute. Yeah. Uh, and But at the same time, it's like, well, I know that my phone is more accurate because it's hooked up to the internet. And so it's based <laughs> off of that. But, like, it's all made up anyway. So what's the actual time? It's all made up. <laughs> well, we're ascribing these different numbers to it. And we're going right. to actually good segue because we're going to talk a little bit about the struggle to measure time and the struggle to come up with something we all agree upon. Right, a universal standard. Yeah, and so that's where, for me, this was some of the research was fascinating. Um, so, like, 30,000 years ago or so, um, prehistoric people were re trying to record the phases of the moon. Right. So, again, that very basic, what I would call broad measurement of time. And, again, that was going to help them figure out what the seasons were because mm -hmm. they didn't have McDonald's and had not, not yet discovered the chicken McNugget, which will never die. So they go from measuring the – checking out the stars, checking the moon, all that stuff. So then you get the Egyptians come along and they come up pretty sure they invented the sundial. Right? I thought you were going to say the sun for a second. And I was they like, oh, that's the a sun. trouble. Yeah. <laughs> they invented the sun. Uh, no, but they they came up with a sundial as near as I could tell. and But the sundial, of course, has some problems. If your day is cloudy. It's an alcoholic. <laughs> it is. It's in, it's in rehab, though. Um, especially because it's ignored now. But the sundial, um, if cloudy days and at night, obviously it didn't work. So there were some severe limitations to the sundial. And they came up with some uh, pretty clever ways around that so they could still record time even at night. Um, here's a little, this is, this is for free. The, this is all for free, but yes. Yeah, but this is more free. Oh, I see. Yeah. The part of the, you know what the part of the sundial that casts a shadow is called? I don't believe I do. It's called the gnomon. G-N-O-M-O-N. -O -O like a gnome. Gnomon. Gnomon. It's a Greek word. Meaning? Um, it just, it literally means it the part of the sundial. It is what it is. Okay. Yeah. It, it's the part that casts a shadow. It's, Interesting. It's also a math term that has to do with a parallelogram. And if you remove one parallelogram, parallelogram <laughs> from another, it's like the part that's left. And I didn't understand that. Oh, okay. So that is like, I don't know. But that's what the nomen or nomen means. You can... Send your emails with the correct pronunciation. Or Watch your mouth Facebook. pod at gmail.com. Throw that in as much as we can. <laughs> Please remember to rate and review us. No one has emailed us. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, it takes a while. Um, sundials also were a little bit challenging because they needed to be calibrated with the different seasons. And as you said, like some people... You have to calibrate the sundial, which I don't even know what that means. Mm -hmm. They're calibrating that. We complain about changing our car clock. Yeah. And I know some people that will not change their car clock. They'll just let it stay just, yeah. an hour off. They live in their own time, in their <laughs> own universe. That's right. They're just like, oh, I am now entering that season of time where my time, my clock. <laughs> if it's you, just raise your hand right now. We see those hands. It's That's fair. another thing we can probably talk. There's a lot of offshoots for this kind of topic, but we can probably talk about uh, the time change at oh, some point sure. due to daylight savings, because that is not a thing everywhere. No, and uh, especially in Indiana. Yes. <laughs> Where part of Indiana had it and part of it didn't. And I, don't, and I used to deliver 
uh, groceries down there when I drove truck. I oh, had really? to go the same day to do different parts of Indiana uh-huh. that w- were an hour off from each other because these counties didn't want to participate. You were a time traveler. I, well, yes, aren't we all, though, moving forward through time? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you should see the look on her face. It's wonderful. <laughs> but I will ask you, though, Milo, are you... You're one of the... I mean, you'll adjust your car clock radio, right? When yes. When time changes, you're not going to leave it no. an hour off. Yeah, me neither. Maybe I forget for like a day or two, but then it bugs me too much and I change it. I got to do it the day of. I'm just going to, yeah. honestly, I just, I can't. It, it bugs me. So, obviously, as we try to get more and more accurate, uh, precise measurements of time, which is, again, weird because it's this kind of made up thing that we do that we all agree upon, though. Right. Kinda like language. Yeah. Um, so you go from keeping, you're, you're observing the sun and stars, and you know they think that Stonehenge at some point was some type of, possibly some type of a sundial. Yes, I feel like I've heard about that. that was, I don't know they know that, that for sure. Estimated. Sure, and there, but there are times of the year that things line up as far mm-hmm. as the sun, and I, I don't know, I've never been there. I would love to, though. Um, so you go from that seasonal type, which is real broad, yep. to sundials, to then you start getting into water clocks. Okay. So we're talking about ancient Persian, ancient Greeks, and they called it. Uh, I'm gonna. You're gonna help me with this. I think it's a. Uh, why? Why you am I that? your Persian well, slash Greek? No, uh, you're you're more language. You're better with languages. Clepsydrae. I. I would say clepsydrae as well. Clepsydrae, so, maybe. Because ancient- is water, maybe. Clepsydrae. Clepsydrae? Maybe. Yeah. So it is an ancient type of water clock, and they would use that when it was cloudy or dark. Mm-hmm. So you have varying types of keeping time. Oh, also, psi is pressure. Ago. Don't don't at me. Go on. What? I said psi was water, but it's actually pressure. Psi oh, means pressure. Well, Go on. Yeah, there's probably. Hopefully, we get to a point people are like, no, what are you talking about? <laughs> everyone knows. Not everyone does know that. Uh, okay. Uh, also, again, we're, I'm talking about the progression of timekeeping devices now. Um, later, Chinese engineers invented clocks incorporating mercury-powered escapement mechanisms. Oh, boy. And this is the 10th century. And then you've got Arabic engineers inventing water clocks driven by gears and weights in the 11th century. So humanity is always trying to figure out how do we keep better track of this? Mm-hmm. How do we become more precise? Accurate is probably not the best word. Yeah. Um, and other things I found out is people would use candles, they'd use incense to help tell time, and then of course you get the hourglass. But there was a candle that would burn down. But again, these aren't very like accurate. an advent candle. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> and they would have little marks uh-huh. that would help I feel them like keep I've seen track time. Of those. But they burned at varying degrees and levels, yep. so it wasn't accurate. And if you wanted to meet someone at a certain time, you may not be there at the same place. Also, who says that you're lighting it at the right time? Yeah, good point. And it gets very interesting. So you got these old water clocks and the first uh, clock escapement mechanisms. Um, but mechanical clocks start to, re- to replace these becoming more and more accurate or precise around 1275. Okay. And then we they have a drawing of this, this, and I don't really understand this term escapement mechanism, but that was something that's used in clocks. And here's your name. 1364, they have a drawing of an escapement mechanism by Jacobo di Dundi. Oh, my. That's good. Jacobo. Yeah, see? Jacobo di Dundi in 1364. That's fun. I like that. <laughs> and then you've got early, so early to mid 14th century, you now start seeing large mechanical clocks begin to appear in the towers of several cities. Mm-hmm. So we're getting to o'clock. I haven't forgotten. We're getting there. <laughs> so you, you're, we're in the 14th century now. You have these clocks starting to pop up all across Europe. It becomes a thing. Any size town that's decent size, they now need to have this clock because they want to show that they you know, are up to date. You want to come live here because we, we have this. Okay. Cutting edge. So these mechanical clocks were really big and popular. Um, pretty much a standard timekeeping device until the pendulum clock is invented in 1656. Okay. By Pendulo di Margaro. And I just made that up completely. I was going to say. I don't know about that one. <laughs> it's not true. It's not true at all. Okay. So now we're going to come around to our topic. 
So now we have an idea of where the clocks come from, some of the history. You've got mechanical clocks, um, you know, more and more popular people are becoming to rely on these. You know, people are understanding, like, okay, this is the thing, we're, we're all relying on this. And one of the main, I, we talked about this a little earlier, one of the main uh, organizations that took over this was the church, mm-hmm. right? So what they would do is they would build these towers, and there would be these clocks, and then these towers would be bells. Yes. And so they would ring bells to help everyone know what time it was during mm-hmm. the day. There's a church in my neighborhood that does that. Yeah, it's Quite lovely. still today, and it is yeah. a very lovely... I didn't know this. Uh, for much of the Middle Ages, they would ring the bell seven or eight times a day. Mm-hmm. They would not ring it every hour because then someone would come and kill the bellkeeper. <laughs> Um, but they would. There was different vespers. There's different bells for mm-hmm. events and time. So this is something that they start going for. And again, time. The, they would ring the bell to signify a call to worship, a call to prayer, and oddly enough, a time for break dancing. <laughs> they would actually have a, a bell, uh-huh. the break dancing bell, and then everyone would get their cardboard yep. out and their stocking cap. And no, I'm just being silly. I'm sorry. I can't help myself. I do really like the mental image of nuns breakdancing, though. Break Everybody dancing ruminate nuns? on that for a minute. Let's get, let's give them a count of three just silently. Let's okay. let people ruminate. A moment on of break, silence for breakdancing break dancing nuns. Just so you can envision it and yep. go. Oh, God, my wimple. <laughs> <laughs> what? A wimple is a part of a nun's habit. I thought so. Yeah. Okay. I was in Les Mis as a nun, so I've worn a whole uh, habit, and it was bad. Yeah, it's 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 quite... They uh, are unpleasant. Yeah, yeah. and they're, uh... Anyway, away from breakdancing nuns, which I did not anticipate that side of <laughs> uh, that, that tangent, but that's okay. So here's where it all comes together. The word clock is thought to have derived from the Latin word clocka, which okay. meant bell. Not cloaca. <laughs> no, no, you'd be tempted to think so. <laughs> but the word claca is pretty sure that meant bell. It also came, oh. meant cloak okay. because of the bell shaped feature of the cloak could look like. Not, sure, okay. I, I think it's, I, I don't see it either, but <laughs> I guess. it's really loose. Anyway, so um, author and history, history blogger Andrea Cephalo, there's a name for you. It's not Pretty bad. Good. Cephalo. Andrea Cephalo had di- has done some research, and she has a website. Um, and the first word of the use clock, um, as opposed to connected to time, apparently is from the Divine Comedy, oh, written by Dante. I have read that. Yeah. And so, just to recap a little, so we start with there's a few different in the Middle Ages. There's different ways for people to tell time, mm-hmm. and then when they wanted to differentiate what measurement of time they were talking about they would say of the clock Mm -hmm. i'm going to meet you at five of the clock which literally would mean i will meet you at five of the bell Mm -hmm. so that's where you get o'clock because it would literally mean from the bell interesting so but of course there's some people out there that are going wait a second dave of the clock is not the same as o'clock it's true. And they may want a little bit of information as to, like, how did that change and mm-hmm. evolve into O'Clock? And there's a little bit of information on this as well. It's actually, and you can imagine, and you talked about this earlier, it's Irish. Mm-hmm. Um, it was an Irish thing to drop the F off of O of, of, right. and just go O instead of of. Right. And that's how we get so many Irish surnames with the O in it, because it's... You're of Mally, you're O'Malley. Of Riley yep. and auto parts at the yes. same time. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh. You guys, O'Reilly would be a great We're not sponsor. getting paid by this. Yeah. Yep. I know. It's free. So, yeah, it is actually called an apocopic form. Which is amazing. To Love do that. that. It is nice. So, in the last syllable Pick or consonant. Pick apocopic. What? Go uh, on. Okay. It's not worth it. No, I don't think so. <laughs> So the last, when the last syllable or consonant is left unpronounced, that's an apocopic form, mm-hmm. and this really started happening around 1720. So, one of the, a couple things, and we're going to kind of wrap up this episode. I really thought it was cool as we look at how we measure time now. How many different cultures have contributed 
to the whole idea of timekeeping. Yeah, absolutely. And language and measurement. And I didn't I didn't know how ancient this was. Yeah. You know, the different numbers that are involved. But again, as you get curious and ask yourself questions about all kinds of things, like why the number 60? Why the number 24? Why mm-hmm. o'clock? There's some, well, we find it very interesting information, or at least I do. So I'm going to give some couple random facts. Okay. Do a little bit of a speed round here. And this... I've got a few because, again, wanting to incorporate a lot of different information in this one without going into individual episodes. Mm -hmm. All right. So it was not until 1884 that, and it was at a conference at Greenwich, where, so in 1884, humans finally reached agreement on a global time measurement. Really? That recent? Yes. Interesting. 1884, the humans finally come together and go, you know what? We should all come together on this. That's wild. Because... One of the big other problematic things about the sundial is the days vary in length. Yes. Right? And um, obviously that's a problem when you might be traveling from one place to another Mm -hmm. and you're going up to Norway as opposed to someone who's much farther south. Right. And you're going to have some real problems connecting and meeting with people. Or in Um, like northern parts of Norway where it's dark. Yeah. For most of the day. <laughs> yeah. It's like, how do you... But then they had different ways of measuring it. But is that mm-hmm. the same way your other people down there are measuring it? And you could miss by quite a bit, actually. So back in 1884, they came up with this international standard. And today, like today right now, we rely mostly on atomic clocks for our most precise time measurements. That's number one. Number two, uh, random fact, AM and PM. Like, uh-huh. What do those stand for? Why do we say AM or PM? We say it all the time. Have you ever thought about why we say AM or PM? Yes, and I'm fairly certain I learned this in some class at some point and then promptly forgot it forever. As well you should. Um, it's Latin. Yep. It's not surprising. Um, AM stands for ante meridium. Sure. Which is just Latin before, it's Latin for before, before midday. Middle. Yeah. Before middle. And then PM stands for post meridium. Okay. Which of course means... After middle or after mm-hmm. midday. Um, I thought this was just a silly little fact, but again, I came across it and I'm like, huh, why do clocks run clockwise? Uh-huh. Because that's the direction the sun would move on the sundial. Yep. So they just kept it. <laughs> but, you know, again, it's like, if you don't really sit and think about this, you just take it for granted that, well, of course it runs that direction. Mm-hmm. But why? And why a circle? It all goes back to the sundial as to why even clocks are circular. Um, and this this is nuts. And I'm just going to kind of, one of the last things on the podcast, um, I'm going to talk for a couple minutes about a project that's in the works right now and being funded by Jeff Bezos. Sure. It's called, It's a, they're building a 10,000-year clock. What does that even mean? It's, it, well, <laughs> we're going to get into it. It is a mechanical clock. That is under construction right now that is designed to keep very precise time for 10,000 years. Okay. It has been dubbed the clock of the long now. I mean, that sounds like (laughs) some B-Ray airport fiction novel. Yep. This is happening. Um, Uh It's being built by the Long Now Foundation. Sure. There is a prototype on display at a science museum in London. Uh-huh. Uh huh. You sound very uncomfortable. Every day, Jeff Bezos just seems more and more like like a comic book villain, or like just, Elon Musk, right? Like they're going to take over the world. They really are. Their names alone are our lives in danger because we've mentioned them in a Could be. negative way. Yeah. Oh dear. Going to have to become superheroes. Is that a drone outside the window? Ah! Ah! Anyway, so there's a there are there's a prototype on display at the science a science museum the science museum in London. Uh, as of June 2018, there's two more prototypes on display at the Long Now Museum and store okay. at Fort Mason Center in San Francisco. Sure. The clock of the Long Now, or the 10,000-year clock, was the brainchild, apparently, of a guy named Danny Hillis okay. in 1986. Not, not a, a great good name. Not a I'm great disappointed name. in you, Danny. You know, this is a quote from him from... Um, Apparently, a magazine called Wired Scenarios in 1995 and an article called The Millennium Clock. Danny said, I want to build a clock that ticks once a year. The century hand advances once every 100 years and the cuckoo comes out in the millennium. Hey, hey, Danny. 
Why? There's more. Danny wants the cuckoo to come out every millennium for the next 10,000 years. Okay. And he said, if I hurry, I should finish the clock in time to see the cuckoo come out for the first time. Of course, that would have been the year 2000. Yeah. The first prototype of the clock began working on December 31, 1999, just in time to display the transition to the year 2000. Um, so, yeah, they're working on a full-scale prototype clock. It's being funded by the Jeff Bezos, cleverly named Bezos Expeditions, with $42 million. And this is being built on land that Bezos owns in Texas. A.K.A. all of Texas. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. So, uh, a found- there's a whole feder- a foundation for this. And one of the guys in the foundation, a Stuart Brand, said... Such a clock, if sufficiently impressive and well-engineered, would embody deep time for people. It should be charismatic to visit, interesting to think about, and famous enough to become iconic in the public discourse. Ideally, it would do for thinking about time what the photographs of Earth from Space have done for thinking about the environment. Such icons reframe the way people think. So you asked why. There's their why. So here's the yes. question for you. Are you buying it? No. Are you that, thinking there's that value? That alone doesn't seem worth it. I mean, I get that people have, like, pet projects of things that are meaningful to them, but it definitely does sound like someone who did mushrooms, and it is <laughs> this is very important to them at the moment. It seems very profound in the moment, but after the fact, it's I, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So here's one of the things that I think is interesting about it. This absolutely caught my attention, and it seems a little odd, but... I'm interested in this is taking a long time for them to build and it's going to last a long time after we're gone or they're gone. And that's not something we always are, do a lot now as humans. And it used to be something we did a lot of thousands yes. of years ago. Hence the pyramids, which they knew the people that started that would not be alive right. anywhere near the end of those things. Right. It's important to think about the vastness of time just as much as important to think of the vastness of space with our photos of space. I mean, it's good to have like a framework of understanding our place in the universe and that it's somewhat small in the grand scheme of things, both in time and space. Yeah. But also maybe coronavirus vaccine first. (laughs) Yeah, well, hopefully. Yeah. 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 Well, and I think it's it's interesting to think about perspective in our our place in space i'd never thought about perspective in our place in time that's mm-hmm. a little bit so i'm going to talk just a tiny little bit more about this um they have basic design principles and requirements for the clock and i'm just going to sure re- yeah go for it that. longevity um and understandably it should, it should be accurate even after ten thousand years uh-huh. and it must not contain valuable parts so it won't be looted yep uh maintainability um, no, nothing more advanced than Bronze Age, bronze age tools mm-hmm. to fix it and keep it working. Transparency. Um, it should be understandable without stopping or disassembling it. No functionality should be opaque. Evolvability, be able to improve it over time. Okay. And scalability to ensure that the final large clock will work properly. Smaller prototypes must be built and tested. They have purchased, this Long Now Foundation, have purchased the top of Mount Washington near Ely, Nevada, which is surrounded by Great Basin National Park for the permanent storage of the full-size clock once it is constructed. It will be housed in a series of rooms with the slowest mechanisms visible first in the white limestone cliffs approximately 10,000 feet up the Snake Range. So this now... This is not about viewing the scope of humanity and recognizing our small place on Earth within the time that we have. It is entirely, it seems, about the ego of these men saying, we want to persist this thing, you know, this is our legacy that will exist for 10,000 years and we will have some, we all have the top of a mountain that is ours for 10,000 years because I'm Jeff Bezos and I deserve it. Freaking... Bezos. Which is kind of the antithesis of what they're saying it's about. Like, the, it's kind of... They're putting their stamp on time, right? Yes, exactly. They're they're staking claim to their time on Earth by saying, we are persisting this far past it. Perhaps what part of this is, and get a little philosophical now, is this idea of, I've achieved and attained so much and have all these possessions and all this wealth, but I'm going to die... And none of this will be mine anymore. And it's this 
very human idea of I want my name and who I was to be remembered beyond right. my death. Which is the same thing as the pyramids. You said earlier that yeah. it was for something to persist after, but it was really to show the power that that, that pharaoh had oh, when he yeah. was alive. It yeah. was entire... That's why they have their faces up in the sphinx and everything. It's because they were like, this is my world, and I know that I'm going to go into the next world, but... I want damn well for everyone after me to remember me. All y'all can remember yep. me because I got this big, huge thing that has now lasted, you know, right. for thousands of years. So it's a weird little contradiction of saying, mm. I know that I'm not here forever, but I'm going to make damn sure that people know that I was here. And the actual clock is going to be made up of Jeff Bezos's face. Oh, no. No, that's not true. Nobody wants that. No. <laughs> All right. Wow. We actually covered a lot of information. In, in 45 pretty- minutes. Yeah. A quick amount of time. So, as we finish, mm-hmm. I'm going to ask you, what was one of the favorite things you learned? We from... should really have a jingle for this segment. Yeah, what you, you think? <laughs> What's the favorite thing you've learned? No? Sure, that works. Okay, that's the one. <laughs> We're not going to remember it. We'll have Tony do something for us. Yeah, we'll see if he will. Um, yeah. So, I think I'm really intrigued by, like, the water clock. Oh, and really? just like these ancient forms of clocks. And mm. I want to know more of the motivation that people had to pin down exact movement of time. Like the math of that fascinates me, even if I know it's probably beyond me. Mm. Um, but also, I hadn't heard of the 10,000 year clock and the infinite now or whatever the hell. The long now. The long now. It sounds like a Star Trek episode. It does. Yeah. Or, yeah, it's. Yeah, so that's something that I'm going to be thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> for a long for a long now time yeah yeah sorry um for me i just when it kind of came to it was just kind of a simple thing and i was a little disappointed because as i was researching this and kind of getting into it and i was kind of i always get excited about the research because i'm like oh that's really cool mm-hmm. i don't know why but certain things of course are very interesting and my stepson I was like, he was in the room where I'm doing the research, and I mentioned to him, like, what I'm doing. He's like, oh, that just means off the clock, right? And I'm like, oh, yeah. yeah. It would have been a much shorter episode if he was running this. Yeah. But I I really, the clocka being um, probably the Latin word for bell, Mm -hmm. and then the... I, I I was just, I thought it was really cool. And they were going like, they were saying of the clock just meant of the bell. Yeah. And they really needed to differentiate that from the different ways of timekeeping back then. Mm-hmm. And I really love the idea that so many cultures have contributed to this. Yeah. Time is, you know, obviously influenced in significant ways by many different cultures. And how much of this has just persisted to today. And, you know, you've got the Irish and you've got, again, the Greeks and the Mm -hmm. Babylonians and the Persians. And it's pretty cool. So It is. That is. That's why you have, that's why we say o'clock. And right now, what time is it, Milo? It is 3.11 o'clock. 3.11. See, people don't say that. (laughs) Uh, People in, oh, I was going to mention this earlier, but it does, I was going to ask, why do people in the UK say, like, noon 30 or oh, I don't know. It makes me so angry. Yeah, or noon o'clock know. also bugs me. And then other um and and other languages they usually say well they'll say like half past the hour or yeah you know they'll say something like that they just don't say o'clock yeah that that's I was what able it is find. in French yeah so that's it that's o'clock that's what we've got for this episode wonderful well thanks for a very bunny traily uh, complicated always, episode with a good name with a good name Jacobo di Dunde yeah. I feel like we should have at least one good name in an episode. And we usually we'll come out clear on that without even trying. One so or two. Yeah. it's pretty exciting. Yeah. So the world is full of good names and good people. And you, good listener, are one of those good people. Thanks if. for joining us. If they're good people, if they what? If they review us. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't review us, no, we don't want to say that. No. But yeah, we should give a little uh, tag on how they can. Yeah, so find you us can and... review us. We're on most streaming platforms. You can follow us on Facebook. We do have Twitter, although we do not post on it that much because I always forget that it's there. Yeah, well. Uh, we have an email at watchyourmouthpot at gmail.com. Feel free to email us with any comments or suggestions or corrections. We will have corrections episodes eventually when we get corrected on things. We're just flawless up to this point. Up to this point, not a single flaw. Except for that time that I said that Melton Mowbray was somewhere it wasn't. (laughs) Sorry, everybody. I did correct myself in an episode, I'm pretty sure, though. But it still haunts me. Anyway, I'm a pedant. 
So, we are all pedants here, yes. but have fun in your pedantry. Yes. <laughs> I'm Milo. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm Kate. We're one of the weirdest side-offs we've had. We're definitely a little meandering, and stay curious, everyone.